Hello, good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to Archives Month 2021. Well, it's almost the end of October, so it's been a really rich Archives Month thus far. We're going to continue the celebration today of all things archives with a virtual discussion on the really fascinating work being done with archival records in the APS Library and Museum related to the history of weather. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape, okay, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose relationships and connections with the land continue to this day and into the future. The society expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of the Lenape, as well as that of numerous other indigenous communities and individuals throughout this continent who have offered their guidance, their expertise, and provided opportunities for collaboration that really truly make the work of the Society's Library Museum possible. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who've made exceptionally significant contributions to the arts, sciences, uh, humanities, and public life. The Society promotes research by providing over $1.5 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. I do hope you'll visit our website, amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. So in honor of Archives Month and the launch of the APS Community Science Weather Project, uh, hosted by Ali Rosbond and Mike Medea in our education department, today's program will introduce you to primary sources documenting weather and the climate collected by the American Philosophical Society. APS founder Benjamin Franklin was well known in this day for his interest in weather phenomena and also for pithy expressions. Some are weather-wise, some are otherwise, for example. His interest has inspired many others over the centuries. New materials documenting historic weather continue to be collected by the APS. In the 21st century, scholars are really looking anew at these materials as they seek to understand climate change. Today's presentations will give you a sense of how these materials appear in an upcoming exhibition, in ongoing digital projects, as well as in cutting edge doctoral research. Now we're using Zoom webinar today for today's discussion. So not to worry, you've all been muted. If you have a question at any time, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You might want to locate it now. Uh, you can ask your question, as I said, at any point, uh, and there will be time at the end of the presentation for questions with our speakers. We're also offer, excited to offer closed captioning for today's virtual discussion. If you'd like to use it during the panel, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar so it's to the right of the Q&A button. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers. And we have four speakers. I'm going to introduce them all now, and I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're speaking. Uh, first up will be David Gary, the Associate Director for collection, of Collections at the Library Museum at the APS. Dave builds, interprets, and protects the Society's collections of books, pamphlets, broadsides, maps, and ephemera. He has a PhD in early American history with a focus on the history of the book from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Our second speaker is uh, David Oliver McCullough, who holds a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Science Education Program in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Dave's research explores the history of educators and educational programs in American science museums, focusing on their respective influence on the development of science museums as institutions. His dissertation is a historical case study of teacher support programs offered at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City from 1880 to 1962. And his project really illuminates the central role that school administrators and educators played in building the museum's status as an authority on classroom and instructional methods. He's conducted research on the history of educational programs at the Franklin Institute Science Museum as well, including those programs created through unique collaborations between educators, corporate leaders, and industrial scientists and engineers. And before doing all of this great work, Dave was an informal science educator in several museums and nature centers. Our third speaker is Byard L. Miller, who is the Head of Digital Scholarship and Technology. Byard is a passionate archivist and public historian who spends his days running the Center for Digital Scholarship and making sure that library patrons can access the diverse array of collections held at the APS. And our fourth speaker is Molly Nebbiolo, a fifth year PhD candidate at Northeastern University and the current Friends of the APS postdoctoral fellow. Molly's dissertation project, Constructing Health, Concepts of Well-Being in the Early Atlantic World 
looks at practices and definitions of public health in 17th and 18th century early American city spaces. And she focuses a lot on Philadelphia, Charleston, and Savannah. Molly's interested in the intersection of health, urbanizing sciences, and early American history. She's also a talented digital humanist and most recently worked on mapping the 1721-1722 smallpox epidemic in Boston for the Historic Epidemics Project at Northeastern University. So four wonderful speakers. Each one is going to speak for about five to eight minutes uh, on a specific archival object that's of particular interest to them. And I'm just going to go ahead and bring up uh, my colleague Dave to start off. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Kyle, for that well, wonderful introduction. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to be focusing on uh, new acquisitions at the APS, and uh, we have a couple of really wonderful weather weather diaries that arrived here about uh, about April or May of 2021. Uh, but you know, we collect widely in the areas of early America, history of science, uh, and indigenous uh, and Native American peoples. Um, and uh, you know, we try to build on those collections as much as we can. And the, the, the weather diaries that I purchased earlier in the year sort of sort of build upon the stuff that we already have at the society, which is really amazing. Let's move forward here, start my, all right. So building on our existing holdings. This is a really wonderful little book um, that's very unassuming that you can look at on the shelf and probably just walk right by it. It's a book of military laws and rules and regulations published in 1814 during the war of 1812. Um, very bureaucratic, uh, uh, lots of lists throughout this book. Um, but what it's really important for is being the first time uh, that uh, the systematic uh, collection of weather data was ordered by the U.S. government. Um, during in these military regulations, the Surgeon General required surgeons in the U.S. Army to uh, start collect start keeping weather diaries. So you see in my um, in my slides, page 227, 228, um, the last sentence in 227, he shall keep a diary of the weather together with account of the medical topography of the country in which he serves. Um, now having, being able to show it this way is actually really useful because I flipping the page would have been difficult uh, on a camera. So it's nice to see. Um, this is a really, really important moment um, of, of basically, how do we get to the point where we can start to predict the weather like we do today? Uh, this is the start of that. Um, this was put together um, by the Surgeon General named James Til Tilton. Tilton was an APS member. And this book was given to us by Daniel Parker, who was the Inspector General of the Army. Uh, and sent it our way. Um, the APS was already known as a place uh, that cared deeply about the gathering of weather data. Uh, and no doubt Parker and Tilton um, knew that and passed along this document to probably the APS's librarian, John Vaughn. Um, the first, uh, so these were, this is 1814, the first journals that started to appear at the Surgeon General's office were 1816. Um, but 1818, the Army revamped um, all of its rules and made it a lot stricter for the surgeons to send journals back. So it got a lot better um, after 1818. So the 1814 moment is, is, uh, is the first, but it didn't really get things rolling. 1818 is when things start to pick up. Um, and then this next one is a, is a document that we have. Um, I believe it's a proof, a proof print for a publication called um, the National Calendar. Uh, the National Calendar was a sort of a digest or almanac of, uh, of, of information about the federal government. And in some way, um, the editor and publisher, Peter Force, who was a known collector of documents and a uh, known publisher of documents, got his hands on some of these journals and published them uh, in 1822, some of these findings from those uh, surgeons that were sending material into the government. Um, so you got some early sort of compilations here. Um, but the first official compilations of, uh, of, of uh, weather data sent in by those surgeons comes in 1826 under the next Surgeon General named James Lovell. And if you look on the image on the left, you can see his name. This, is, this document was presented by Lovell himself to, to the APS. Um, so this is really um, where we start to get to um, the, the large publication of, of data in a pretty serious way. 1826, this comes out. There's another one published in 1830 uh, and another one published in 1840. So there are these sort of ongoing publications uh, that gather these weather, uh, weather data. and in this first one, 1826, there are 18 different uh, places that are being uh, represented, um, everything from Minnesota all the way down uh, to Florida. Um, they were required to take temperatures at 7 a.m., uh, 2 p.m., and 9 p.m. Uh, to get the, uh, the pressure and to get weather, uh, to get wind direction, as well as uh, 
um, any sort of like anomalies that are happening in the area. Um, and so, you know, this was a goal to sort of start building up um, data over time. And uh, you know, this is a moment when you know the country just doesn't know a whole lot about what's going on in the West. It's trying to figure out what is out there, um, and this is a way to sort of get that to get that information, keep track of this data. Um, it's also a moment in the Enlightenment when you have um, people believing that they could change if they change the land or if they change the landscape, um, you know, drain swamps or cut down trees. They could uh, change the environment, make it healthier, and make it better for people to uh, do work or um, uh, produce on the land. Um, so there are, um, and it's like, it might seem strange to sort of have these like just lists of, of temperatures and wind, wind directions, uh, but there were uh, practical purposes to, to this. And just to show you our new acquisition that came in, um, like I said, this came to us in April, April, May, uh, relates nicely to those materials I just showed you. Um, there are two sets of weather diaries that we bought. Um, this one here is a, is a set of data that started in 1838 and was collected until 1866 by a man named George Barrell, who worked on Wall Street as a produce broker, uh, which is a, 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 a nice sounding job. I, wonder, I was always wondering why the difference between a produce uh, broker and a stock broker. Uh, the stock broker must made a lot more money. Um, but here we have Barrel collecting huge amounts of data um, over decades of time. Um, the one, the picture on the right here will give you a sense. And just so you know how he did it, it's actually nice. This collection came with the three compilations of the entire decade. But then in this picture here on the left is, is Barrel's sort of day by day uh, recordings. What he would do is take the material from this diary from 1838 and then at the end of the year put the data into those books. So it was a lot handier for him. Uh, unfortunately, the only sort of single year diary where he has these sort of more uh, detailed notes um, is, is, the, is the diary from 1838 that came with our collection. And the other diary here on the right is from a man named Wallace Estel. So Wallace Estel was a military, um, a, a military surgeon. He was working in Franklin, Tennessee in um, the mid to late 1850s. And you can see here it's very, um, uh, it's very systematic, it's very organized. And um, I, can't, I can't say for sure, but what I think this might be is um, an example of those medical, uh, those surgeon, surgeon diaries keeping track of the weather. Um, I, I don't know of any other one at the APS, so having an example of one of those diaries I think is, is very important, especially as we roll into um, the climate science exhibit that's taking place next year. Um, so happy to answer any questions about those. It's a really, um, a really amazing little collection that we bought and um, looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Dave. Um, <clears throat> so I am uh, David Oliver McCullough, um, as Kyle said in, uh, in the really generous uh, introduction. Um, am I sharing the right screen? Let me check. Awesome. Um, in, in my role here at the uh, APS, I'm curating the History of Climate Science exhibition that's coming up in uh, 2022, April of 2023. So, I've had the great fortune of working with everyone that's here on the WeatherWise uh, program today, uh, borrowing information from them, consulting them. And uh, today I want to talk about some objects that actually were referred to me by the director of the library and museum, Patrick Spiro, and his assistant, Dr. Brenna Holland. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some materials that come to us from the um, APS Committee on Education and Participation in Science Collection. And so what we have here that you're looking at in this particular screen is a, a series of tree rubbings or, or rubbings of tree rings, which are used to determine based on the width of the ring, the, the size of the tree rings and the width, basically to get some information about the climate, how moist it was on a given year, how much uh, precipitation, et cetera. So let's take a look at another one of the, the uh, tree ring rubbings that are in the collection. This one is taken from a white oak in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, not exactly sure the date, it was kind of hard to read, but I want to zoom in a little bit. And you can see from this, this particular rubbing that, the, that we have a 1768 is one year identified there, several years. And so this is, these tree ring rubbings were used as part of a broader study to, again, get some sense of the, the climate of Pennsylvania going back some time. 
and this is a little bit the, the information tag that so the information written at the, the end of that particular strip i don't know if you can see where it says rubbing done it I, i'm assuming that's a nine but it looks like a question so we'll keep that question mark there for right now until i can confirm the exact date so this was part of a larger project that was actually funded in 1939 by the Carnegie Foundation, who funded the APS for a project to survey how many Philadelphians were doing science as amateurs. So if the term that we use now, of course, is citizen science, and, and I don't know if everyone's had a chance to enjoy the Dr. Franklin Citizen Science Exhibition that's now currently on display at the, uh, the APS Museum. Um, but this is one of the, the APS's earlier forays into that field. So the, the Committee on Education and Participation in Science was formed as a result of that funding from the Carnegie Foundation. And W. Stephen Thomas, who was actually the first head of education at the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia, was chosen to lead the committee and that survey. And this picture here, we're looking at a, a proof or a, a sample cover for a book, The Amateur Scientist, that Thomas wrote as a result of that study. This was published in 1942. And he found that during 1939 and 40, there were roughly 287 organizations that were providing science opportunities for 32,000 people in the Philadelphia region. So this particular tree green climatology project was part of a much broader constellation of, of science pro projects that everyday Philadelphians were participating in right before World War II. So there were two people who were key figures in this tree green climatology project. One was Edward E. Wildman and uh, Edward E. Wildman was the head of this project. The, the project was actually taking place at the Academy of Natural Sciences and administered through the APS through W. Stephen Thomas. And Wildman was chosen because in 1933, he actually wrote a book called Pins Woods, where he surveyed the entire area looking for trees that had been around during the time when William Penn first came to this area. And so because of that, he had a great sense of where the, all the old trees were and also what structures in the Philadelphia region were built using some of those older trees. And with that knowledge, they were able to find out exactly where they needed to go to get the exact trees, the exact pieces of timber that could make or give the best data for the tree ring climatology project. And the other person I want to mention is Mrs. Linwood R. Holmes. I wasn't able to find a photo of uh, Mrs. Holmes. And I also am referring to her by her married name because almost everywhere I see her name, it's she's referred to as such. So if you want to do your own research, which I highly recommend, um, you would look for Mrs. Lidwood R. Holmes. I think her, 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 her first name is Elmer. I'm still digging around on that. Um, but Mrs. Holmes actually finalized the method that they used uh, for the bulk of the project. And even though, as we can see, this is a return slip for one of the first meetings about the project, um, Mrs. Holmes was a housewife, uh, certainly interested in botany, but she was able to develop the methods that were used for the project and that were okayed by the scientists who were actually collecting this data from the, the citizen scientists themselves. Um, so she's a really important figure and someone who I hope we can find out even more about. And so just wanted to return to this trip and keep in mind that this is a housewife here in Philadelphia. And of course, there's a lot more to know about her. Was she college educated? Um, and so these are thing, themes that certainly uh, Dr. Caroline Johnson, who's the other Andrew Mellon fellow, and working on the upcoming uh, Women in Science exhibition that'll come after the climate exhibition. I'm sure Dr. Dr. Johnson will be exploring some of those things as well. Um, and just a few more questions that that this leaves me with. Uh, are there, is the data that are in these tree ring climatology rubbings that are in our collection, that are still useful? Like, can we use those data or can other scientists use those data? What can we learn about this constellation of organizations that were supporting the study of weather in Philadelphia right before World War II? And what more can we learn about the APS and its role in, region, in the regional scientific community in the mid 20th century? So lots of fun questions. And uh, thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of the speakers. Hello. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Byron Miller. Uh, thanks to Dave and Dave. That was great stuff. Um, so I'll just dive right in. Uh, so I fell into the weather records game uh, by way of the Center for Digital Scholarships uh, Open Data Initiative. Um, so briefly, uh, under this initiative, we select items from our collections that are conducive to being reconfigured as data sets. We digitize them, we transcribe them, 
structure the data and then release them as data sets for anyone to use. Uh, basically, we take material that looks like what you see here on the left and turn it into what you see on the right. Uh, the big benefit that this has is the level of access it can provide to researchers because it can be used by anyone at any time with very little restriction. Uh, and most recently, we've been uh, diving into uh, weather records. The APS has a, a good amount of weather records held within its collections. Uh, the initial phase of our project has focused on James Madison's weather diaries, uh, as you can see pictured here. Uh, these weather records are amazing, uh, but to a casual user, it's just a lot of numbers uh, on a page and in its current form, current form, it's extremely difficult to make sense of and even more time consuming to do any detailed analysis. Uh, so what we like to do is get this valuable information off the page and into a form that will be far easier for researchers to consult. <clears throat> we think this will have, uh, will offer scholars unprecedented access to data that's ripe for analysis. We'll definitely have implications for scholars of climate change, environmental history, labor history, history of science technology, and much, much more. Uh, I really like these Madison journals uh, because it seems that he sort of just uh, picked up this sort of uh, weather collection as a favor to an old friend uh, and was basically inspired to record the weather because of a classic uh, old world climate versus new world climate beef between the two gentlemen pictured here, uh, his buddy Thomas Jefferson on the right and uh, Georges Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, uh, um, on the left. Um, so Jefferson was just so embittered by the notion that anyone could consider the, that the new world had a degenerative climate that he set out to disprove this theory. Uh, they built a small army of citizen scientists along the way. And many of these records, including Madison's, uh, ended up here at the APS. Um, so we are currently in the process of digitizing and transcribing many of these records. I'll admit that this slide that you're looking at here is a little chaotic looking, um, that's super intentional as it represents the chaotic nature of data projects such as these, as well as the sometimes chaotic nature of just data collection overall. We've got all these different accounts and all the authors kept their records uh, using uh, various systems, but definitely uniquely their own. Uh, this is a current problem that we're considering. Our uh, ultimate goal uh, for transcribing these records is to create a federated portal of historic weather records. This is a collaborative project that we're undertaking uh, with partners at uh, Princeton Papers of uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, UVA's uh, Center for Digital Editing. Essentially, uh, what we and our partners are trying to do is bring all these records uh, from the APS, but also ones outside of the APS collections together into one massive data set of historic weather data. Uh, but the problem is if we want them to eventually speak to one another in any sort of meaningful way, as we intend to do, uh, it's our job to create uh, a data model that would render all these data sets uh, interoperable. And this is an ongoing conversation that we're, that we're having with our partners. So uh, the work we, we have cut out for us is uh, a lot, uh, but we're super excited about the challenges that lay ahead. Um, so that's where we're at right now. Um, so stay tuned for more. But in the meantime, I, I really urge everyone to go take a look at uh, our partners, uh, handsome new site that they just developed based around uh, Thomas Jefferson's own weather records. Uh, thanks. Hello, one second. Um, everyone can see this, yes? Cool. I'm going to assume that that did yes. Um, hi, I'm Molly Nebbiolo. I'm one of the pre-doctoral fellows here at the APS, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've used some of the weather records um, that have appeared here in the APS collections and how they have been used in my dissertation. Um, so I study um, the history of public health in the 17th and 18th century um, in cities of Philadelphia, Charleston, and Savannah. So I really look at how does the definition of public health change over time? Um, where is it present? How does it relate to the urbanization of pre-planned cities? Um, and weather has a big um, influence in, in this study as well. So how can weather help us to study other histories? Um, and kind of to brief, briefly cover it because I don't have time. Um, 
or I think energy to go into the larger historiography of environmental and, and the history of weather. But um, the history of people is also a history of things around them. And a lot of that includes the history of weather itself. And that's why I think it's really interesting to see how climate history and history of weather has um, been, become a popular topic in, for historians and also for historians of the early colonial period like myself. Um, and for environmental history, kind of with weather, what is our or what is the human relationship with weather? And, and, and I think that's something that is extremely interesting and I think very topical for multiple different fields of history. Um, and here I just have a couple of examples of like, you know, we're dependent on weather. So weather kind of helps feed us, but also um, with the climate here, we see the photo of um, the historic flooding that happened in Philadelphia a couple of months ago. Weather can also destroy cities and kind of be an abrasive, um, kind of uh, experience for humans. So how do we study that? And my example is um, this specific document here, which is the minutes of, and the proceedings of the committee. Um, on the 14th of September in 1793, by the citizens of Philadelphia um, to attend and to alleviate the sufferings of the afflicted. So for me and for my research, um, the history of weather appears when I'm studying disease and um, and and health. So this has been extremely interesting as a as a pamphlet, as a collection of meeting minutes during the yellow fever epidemic of Philadelphia in 1793. Because here you can see in the back they um, meticulously recorded the weather for for each day during the disease. So almanacs recorded what the weather should be like for every day for a year. And, and through the recording of weather for almanacs, um, an extra table was put in at the end of um, the set of, of meeting minutes by the government as they kind of responded to uh, the yellow fever epidemic. Um, and to kind of go a bit into the history of, of yellow fever and its relationship with weather and, and kind of to answer some broader questions of why does medicine or why do doctors pay close attention to um, weather. Um, the yellow fever epidemic happened between August and about the end of November of 1793 in Philadelphia. They were having a drought, so the water in the Delaware River um, was quite low. It was very muddy. There were a lot of pools of stagnant water. And as we know now, yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes and mosquito bites. So this was perfect, um, a perfect setting for mosquitoes to thrive in. Um, a lack of rain, very hot, humid weather. Um, and this is why the mosquitoes were thriving. And as ships were coming in, bringing in more mosquitoes from more tropical areas that were carrying the yellow fever, um, the epidemic kind of happened and, and exploded and was exacerbated by the fact that this weather was fortuitous for these mosquitoes um, to live for a very long time and to infect as many people as possible. Um, another reason why these records are really interesting here is because weather was so integral to the way that humans in the 18th century um, thought about themselves and their relationship with the environment. So yellow fever wasn't new in 1793. Many people have either experienced this, it or um, had read about it or in um, other happening in other cities and other places in the Atlantic world. And they knew generally speaking that once it got cold, once they experienced the first frost, something would happen that would allow them to become healthier and yellow fever to stop. Obviously, this is related to the death of the mosquitoes, um, which wasn't known in the 18th century. So the recording of weather and studying of weather was their way of also trying to understand their environment um, and also record kind of when frosts happened and how they might be able to potentially deal with this in the future or provide um, kind of background information to, to draw correlations between the events of the epidemic in 1793 to potentially the weather that happened, um, which is extremely smart. Um, so this is just one example of how I'm using um, weather records in my dissertation, which isn't necessarily a dissertation on the history of weather in this period of time, but how people experienced, um, recorded, and, and um, 
thought about weather in, in, in the realm of health and urbanization of cities, but also an example of how weather records can appear in different ways. Um, it's not, I didn't specifically look for weather records when I was doing this research, but it appeared at the end of this um, manuscript and it's been very helpful. So that's it, thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to ask our panelists to come up and unmute themselves. Uh, well, you have inspired lots of questions. They are flowing into the Q&A down there. Um, so let me uh, let me pick through this. We have about 23 minutes or so for questions. Um, Dio, maybe I could lead off with a question for you. Um, as the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow, a title I failed to say in your introduction, of course, the key part uh, of, your, of what you're doing here, um, you're, putting a, you're putting an exhibition on using all of this. Can you maybe, you know, you've been here probably what, about 18 months now, year and a half, is that right? So um, when you first got here and to where you are now putting this exhibition together, let's just talk a little bit about are there more resources here or less sources here for studying historic weather than you expected? Um, and are there types of sources that we haven't touched on today that you're really excited to use in the exhibition itself? Sure. Gosh, what a great question. Um, I would say, I don't know what I expected to be frank. Um, the, the APS is such a unique and special organization that um, part of the joy of being here is, is being able to explore um, what's here. and. Starting during the pandemic, access was a challenge, but that also gave me the opportunity to learn from all the staff. So uh, obviously Dave Gary, who's, who's here on the call, has been instrumental. I, it'd be kind of hard for me to overstate how important he's been in identifying sources. Molly was nice enough to take some time to talk with me. I consulted Byard. Um, and as I mentioned, Dr. Patrick Spiro, Dr. Brent, like everyone in the staff has, has called out um, resources and collections. Um, obviously the 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 weather journals are really rich resources, but one of the things that Dave Gary has brought to, to the exhibition that's so special are the maps and, and mapping is, is the, but so, and I think Dave mentioned it um, in his, his talk, like these data are the foundation for maps and maps are really one of the major transformations in the study of weather and climate. And one of the first major steps towards forecasting. So, um, yeah, but that's what the exhibition is for. Come see the exhibition when it's done. Come see all the amazing maps. There's some incredible maps uh, from the War Department, um, direct result of, of some of the, the sources that Dave showed, and also from the U.S. Weather Department, but it is uh, part of the Department of Agriculture. So lots of great images and visualizations of weather. That's fantastic. And the exhibition's opening in April of 2022. Is that correct? Yeah. Joel. Sure. Feels a long way off, but maybe it'll be here sooner than we know it. Um, sooner than we know it, yeah, for sure. So it looks like we're waiting for, uh, I think Dave Gary's having a little few technical difficulties. So there's some questions for him. So I'll, I'll wait on that. Um, I had a great question here from uh, Eleanor Cohor and uh, that uh, I think touches on some of the things that Byard started to talk about. Um, can you talk about efforts that the APS has made to migrate the information from weather logs into machine readable data so that it can be more usable for climate scientists or is it something that you're going to be doing more of in the future? Yeah, uh, lots more of it in the future. Um, yeah, so basically we transcribe these things, we put them in CSVs and we put them out there for everybody to download them. But that, that is the ultimate goal of this larger project is like to create this massive database so that people can actually read and, and use these records. Um, so, yes. But lots more. I mean, like, so we've we've got a lot of the digitization out of the way, but the putting them in machine readable format, that's that's the hard part because it takes human beings to do that. Um, and it, it, it's a lot of time and effort that goes into transcribing these documents. So we've got a, a good amount of transcription done. So all the Madison stuff is transcribed and out there for download. The Rittenhouse stuff, we have David Rittenhouse's stuff that is transcribed and should be available for download. Um, all these other ones that we've digitized, um, are now in our digital library and you can go look at the records, um, not transcribed yet though, but soon, forthcoming. Molly, you worked on this project last summer, right? Or is it two summers ago? Last summer. Last summer. Do you, 
Do you want to talk a little bit about what it meant for you to kind of dip into this work, um, both on the on the side of being a transcriber, uh, transliterator, but also on the side of being a scholar who you know found meaning in some of this material? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. So it fulfilled my need as a as someone before I wanted to be a historian and wanted to be a meteorologist. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I can, you know, work on weather stuff, even though I'm not going to be a meteorologist. So it kind of itched, itched that um, or scratched that itch. But also it was extremely fascinating working on the Madison data, um, I think, as a historian, because um, I was confronted with a lot of um, new ideas about definitions towards weather. The way that we define certain weather patterns now were very different than the way that Madison or the people transcribing um, the weather for Madison in his diaries noted it. So it made me more self-aware of how important understanding terms from the period is to contextualizing the data itself. Um, but also, as I just mentioned now, um, particularly with the Madison data, there's different um, handwriting at different points in time. So it really made me interested in thinking, okay, this weather is being um, written down um, at, um, you know, at Montpelier and um, like who is there knowing where Madison is? Um, like who might be recording this data? Um, how is it being standardized, if at all? How does it change over the course of these years? Um, they take notes of like certain thermometers breaking and bringing in new ones to, to record things. So it just, it just um, put a lot of different, I don't know, historical questions around who is actually writing this type of intellectual data um, in, kind of in the forefront of my brain. So it was a really fun, it was very fun. <laughs> I think that's a nice segue to a question here that came up with something Dave Gary said, but I think that Dave McCullough has uh, maybe something to say about uh, so our anonymous attendee writes, I'm surprised to hear that the military had an interest in the weather. Could you talk more about the military's interest and also maybe what influence the military being involved in weather reporting might have had? Um, I, I think it would be hard to overstate uh, the influence of, of the military and the development of, of American meteorology. Um, what, so, the, the source that Dave identified, which I don't think I've looked at, and I really want to take a closer look at, um, points to the fact that the Surgeon General was was behind the, the military's first attempts to or efforts to collect weather data. And that's because the perception of climate at that time connected climate with health. And so concerns about the, the health of, of, of servicemen fueled their interest in collecting weather data. And then just logistically speaking, if at various army outposts throughout the nation as, as what we think of as the United States is continuing to move westward. Uh, these outposts provide a lot of coverage. And if you think about it, if you want to study weather and climate, you need to cover a lot of distance. And you need to cover time. And so you have the labor and you have the, the, like, the locations um, and the interest. But throughout, I mean, through World War II, even through today, um, the military is a is a key, key, key cog in the development of American meteorology, particularly with an interest to control weather um, for, for strategic advantage, um, which seems crazy, but it's so persistent, um, going all the way back to the source that Dave, like Dave Gary showed us from 1814 uh, through today. So the military is central, central. That's actually fascinating. Um, there's another question in here about uh, local history. Uh, so I open this up to all of you who've been looking through the collections. Um, Kim McCarty is particularly interested in observations data on the Delaware River, uh, observations on Philadelphia and the Bucks County region. Uh, are there sources in the APS library for Kim to use? So Bucks County, Philadelphia area, um, 18th century, 19th century sources that come to mind? Yeah, yeah, uh, I, a lot. I. I... I don't have my list in front of me, but yeah, there's a good amount of stuff here um, for a, a lot of different areas around here. Um, so, I mean, definitely Philadelphia. Uh, I think there's some stuff in Bucks County. Um, I mean, uh, we've got, I'm working on one right now. It's uh, stuffing at the Wick House in Germantown. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a wide variety of records here for this area. So yeah, for sure. 
there's the, the written house is written house weather journals right uh, yep. william ponytail i think mm -hmm. I'm that correctly uh who had a winery he's collecting weather data for his, his winery um but it, yeah there's it, yeah buyers right there's a lot there's a lot of trouble yeah, a ton. Yeah, and, and yeah, and, and William Point now, I, I I never say that name right either. Um, but uh, he also collected weather on a like a, a voyage from like England to Delaware as well. So he was capturing the weather like on his ship as he was going as well, which is pretty interesting. So, yeah, a whole variety of records here. Uh, and can you remind us? Uh, so if somebody wants to come in and use these collections, is the library open now, uh, or will it be open? When will it be open? I know the answer to that. I guess I could have answered that. <laughs> you could have answered that question yourself. Um, the library is currently closed to three room uh, by appointment only, I think. Uh, we're in the process of, we have a, a whole reshelving project happening, so we're close to researchers for now, but we will be open soon. Um, our digital library is not currently available, but it, it should be within the next few days. And all these resources that I've mentioned for the weather, plus many, many more are available online because they're already digitized. Uh, the beauty of working you know, uh, to develop these exhibits is lots of more things get uh, digitized and become widely available to people. Uh, so please go find these things and, you know, feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have other questions about these resources. Thank you. Uh, great question here from Abigail Shelton asking, who says, thanks for these great presentations. Yep, old APS friend. Uh, what kinds of weather metrics, like temperature, et cetera, did people measure in the 18th and 19th century and have those, do you see those units of measurement changing at time, over time? Don't, um, there, there's certain, I mean, uh, temperature, you know, Fahrenheit, it's relatively consistent. There's, there's an interesting relationship between the technology to study weather and the types of data that are collected so certainly there was always an interest in, in uh, um, humidity, um, air pressure, um, but barometers go far back. There's lots of developments of hygrometers. Um, yeah, it's really a question of technology. Um, the basic units I feel like are pretty consistent and fired. I don't know if you, if you find that to be true too, as you can digitize them. Yeah, I think so. So uh, I don't know if you know, like. The... <laughs> I should know the answers, but when hygrometers like sort of fall off, but like, so all these people that are collecting uh, the records, it's an issue that we're going to run into with this project is like, who's collecting barometric pressure, stuff like that. Cause not everybody's taking that down. Uh, so they do temperature readings. Most of the people that we have do temperature readings twice a day. Um, uh, and same with the pressure. Then they do, uh, a lot of them do wind direction as well. Uh, and then what I find most fascinating about all these books is they're just stray observations about uh, plants, uh, food that's grown, uh, uh, birds that they see, uh, leaves falling, stuff like that. I think that gives us a, uh, a real interesting sort of visual on you know, what's happening on the ground there. Um, and, and something that I'm interested too, so I, sorry, the small digression, but we have journals that are actual like written out journals that document the weather that aren't structured like the Madison ones, Rittenhouse ones, that I'd be interested in, in eventually incorporating into this project. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to pull that stuff out. Just, uh, oh, go ahead, Ali, I'm sorry. Um, just to kind of piggyback off of that, since I've worked on the Madison data a bit, I think the thing that's unstructured is what you just mentioned, Bayard, with the observations of data. Specifically with Madison, what's interesting is that you see when Jefferson asks him to record this weather data on the back of some of the early pages, um, he's writing down definitions of what constitutes like haziness or cloudiness versus, you know, something like partly cloudy or what have you. So it's interesting because there's attempts to standardize observation, but at the same time, you can't necessarily standardize this type of observation too. And I think we see that when we're checking the weather every day and it says like cloudy, but then it's sprinkling and we get upset or something to that effect. So it's interesting that there's some standardizations that stay the same over time, but things like observations, which provide, I think the most useful data sometimes um, is, is very, you know, uh, difficult to standardize. 
and, and I just was to piggyback on Molly's point, um, as various weather networks uh, are, are created, um, you kind of beginning with the military, there's always attempts to standardize. Like there's always like, this is how we take these observations, these are the specific instruments, these are the times, to Byron's point, like there, there are certain specific times that they have to be taken. So it's like a constant, to, to Molly's point, like the challenge of, of keeping things consistent gives us the ability to trace efforts to standardize and, and kind of organize that, that effort, but it's always a challenge. Yeah, and one more thing on that too. So, so Jefferson, I said earlier, he armed, maybe created an army of citizen scientists to do this. He sent out directions to Madison, like this is what you do, this is how you do it. So you see consistency in a lot of these books, but then you get to like Rittenhouse and then there's all sorts of like lunar calculations and just stuff that uh, it's pretty wild. Hey Dave. Welcome back, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. It's all good. Uh, so we have a great question here from Bob Hauser, the APS CEO, who asks, um, and this may be one for you, Bayard, has the APS informed the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or other relevant agencies about the creation of these new resources on historical? Uh, yeah, um, so we haven't specifically, but uh, one of our partners, uh, Jim McClure from Princeton, I know that he's We've been building a, a, a basically a team of stakeholders, and so, he, so he's been actively uh, looking at these places where we can put this data, and has been in conversation with places like that. So, uh, the early stages of that, Bob. Excellent, great, thank you for that. Um, here's a a lot of questions here. I'm trying to get through them. Um, here's one uh, from Molly. Um, when did cities start thinking about the connection of weather and health? And do you find from your research that cities are reactive or proactive when it comes to thinking about the issues you're studying? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful question. Um, specifically with um, the cities that I'm looking at, they're Anglo cities that are pre-planned. So Savannah, Charleston, and Philadelphia are pre-planned. And so they're thinking about this beforehand. So it's very closely tied to health as well. Um, however, in the case for Charleston, the current location of the city does get moved because um, the location is poor, both for weather and for health. Um, you know, they have hurricanes to deal with that Philadelphia doesn't have to think about. Um, and Savannah doesn't, you know, get constructed until the 1730s, as opposed to the 1670s for Charleston. Um, so it's interesting to see how they do respond or react to them. But I think um, for a more general kind of historiography of city making, um, places like London or, or Paris, I don't think they're necessarily thinking about weather um, per se, but more extreme phenomenon um, or ways of controlling things like water sources, like rivers and creeks and, and things like that. Um, so I think weather is on the mind because, you know, it's integral to the way that they're considering themselves healthy or not healthy and keeping themselves healthy. Um, but I don't think that they find, I think they find themselves more, or they think that they're in more in control of the weather than they usually are. So I think it's a lot of, they think they're being preventative, but they're actually reacting most of the time, which I think is a lot of what we're experiencing now with cities and climate change is that we think we're doing a really great job. And then the next hurricane comes or the next major flood or the next, next nor'easter. Um, so I think that I think is a very complicated answer and I hope it kind of gives context to your question. That's very helpful. Um, so uh, Brand Vogel has very uh, helpfully encouraged everyone to, who's watching today to get involved with the International Commission on the History of Meteorology. Um, Brand has generously uh, given me his email address and I just put that into the chat. So uh, if that's of interest, please follow up um, with Brand. Um, we have a couple of local questions here. Um, maybe Dave, since you've come back, uh, we, had, <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the military um, and DO was helpful in, in kind of helping us think through that. Uh, I'm kind of curious, are weather records highly collectible on the market? Uh, are you finding yourself having to bid up? And I realize in asking this, I might be creating you know, some market demand or some competitors for you, but 
you know, you do a lot of acquisitions for the APS. Is there a lot of material out there? Is it, you know, something that we can still acquire or is it really hard to find? I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's extremely hard to find, but it's not easy to find. Um, you know, the, the weather journals were, were inexpensive, but not, you know, crazy expensive. They're very, it's a very niche sort of area of collecting. So, I mean, it's, I, there's not a whole lot of, I don't think it's a very large group of people who would want to gather uh, weather data on their own. Um, institutions like the APS or other, other libraries or, or museums would probably be a better place for it. Um, but I mean, in the print, in the world, in the realm of the, the, the printed book, there are all sorts of rare books about the history of weather going back to the 16th, 17th century that are available. Um, there was a really large collection put up by Peter Harrington recently that Dio shared with me, which is actually quite good. Um, the history of weather is, is in the history of climate. It's just a vast um, area. So, you know, you could collect something like, you know, uh, Rachel Carson's, you know, um, Rachel Carson's book, you could, and you could gather, you know, like what I just bought, like, you know, some serious, you know, uh, serious weather data. So it's like a very, it's a wide ranging area. I'm sure the material that work that I bought recently that I just talked about um, would not be as popular as some of the other materials I just mentioned. So a couple of questions here I'm gonna to group together about, again, about sort of local sources. Uh, James Hill, a good friend of the APS asked, did the Lazaretto on the Delaware keep weather data? And while you're thinking about that, uh, Susan Anderson, um, wants to know if any of the panelists have checked the weather records at Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, Franklin co-founded the hospital in 1751 and suggests they document the weather as well. It's a decent sized data set and may complement one or more of the projects uh, if, if we haven't accessed them yet. Um, I'm our panelists. <laughs> I can maybe answer the Lord's Loretta question. I haven't been over there to check it out um, of what remains in that area, but I don't think they necessarily are keeping weather data and in the 18th and 17th century per se. I think if weather data appears in the records that may or may not exist, um, it would appear in the form of um, schedules of when ships are arriving to keep control of like what ships are coming in and out of port um, and, you know, making it seeing where they're coming from and what diseases might be, you know, present that they need a, to go check out since it was uh, the Lazaretto was, you know, formed to keep people healthy. So if they're checking out boats and someone there is ill, they quarantine them on the ship for X amount of days before they can come into port to visit Philadelphia. So I think that's a really great question. And that's my guess of how weather would appear in those records. We'll say there's a, oh, uh, in 1834, uh, there was a joint committee on meteorology uh, with the, the American Philosophical Society, the Franklin Institute, um, University of Albany, and uh, the Navy was involved as well. Um, and they, they did, particularly like in later in the 1830s, they did distribute materials throughout the state of uh, Pennsylvania to various locations um, to collect weather data. And I haven't been able to track down those weather data, but they have to be aggregated somewhere. Um, and I'm imagining there's local collections of those data. I'm hoping, I, I don't know, but it's a, it's a thread that uh, anybody who's interested might be, might be interested in kind of following on their own in their own region. Um, again, the Joint Committee on Meteorology that started in 1834. So that might be a good source of, of finding. I, I, we haven't had much luck, but you know, that's just us right now. So. Great. Well, it sounds like we'll have to reach out to our friends at the Pennsylvania Hospital and find out about that data set. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, I, I'm aware of that, but it's a, we're so focused on what we have here in house first, and then we'll expand the project. Like, because Presbyterian, Pres Presbyterian Historical Society, they have the other Madison, there's like two years of Madison records that they have that we don't have that I would love to incorporate into our data set as well. So, expansion. All right, so we'll take it. So final question, it's from Sandy Lloyd, another great friend of the APS. Is the APS sponsoring any current collection of weather data, which can then be compared to historic records to understand changes over time? Yes. <laughs> so uh, we have a, a, a community science project that's actively going right now with our uh, museum education staff. They reached out to local schools, um, giving them analog instruments where uh, taught them how to collect the weather data. And then we're going to take that data and uh, I think for the upcoming exhibit, right? So and then we're going to compare it to uh, 
uh, data from the early uh, 19th century. Uh, so Anne Haynes stuff at the Wick House in Germantown and then to uh, Rittenhouse data in Philadelphia uh, in the late 18th century and sort of compare where the collections over time. So, yeah. And of course, there's the great contemporary collection of data that's happened at the Wink House too, right? So that we have yeah. lots of wonderful partners working together to think about past and present um, as we look towards um, hopefully uh, a less uncertain future, but I guess that's a little up in the air. <laughs> so, well, please, uh, a round of applause for our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to share these great collections with us. Um, this has been recorded as well, so if, uh, if you have friends who didn't get to watch, uh, we'll be uh, posting this on our YouTube page probably in a week or so. Uh, please come back. Thanks, everyone. Take care.